Okay, so let me very quickly take you through the possible scenarios you might face when you look at that HCS page for your company. Okay, I'm going to take you through eight very different examples of companies. So take a look at your page while I'm going through because one of these pages might fit your company. So let's start with institutional default. This is Disney in 2003. The institutional default is when almost every person on your list or every name on your list is an institution, a mutual fund or a pension fund. And the bottom line is when this is the case, you as a stockholder are screwed. Nothing you can do, right? Because it, it, there's nobody pushing for you. Yeah. Well, basically, every, every investor is an institution. None of them is going to push for you. You're stuck, right? So that's Disney in 2003. So if you look down the list and you say, there's nobody here who's going to watch out for me, that's it, right? As I said, lots of big companies, you're already here. Right? Second on the list, and this goes back to, I think, what Stephanie noted, that in her company, the biggest stockholder was the company itself. So there's China Mobile. Largest stockholder in China Mobile is China Mobile. What does that tell you? Again, it's a control. If you're a stockholder, it says, look, you're going to have very little control in this company because of the way the corporate structure is set up. It's amazing how complex corporate structures get and the intent almost always is control. So when people have complicated structures, there's a reason for it. It didn't happen accidentally. So that's a, you know, essentially the company holds shares in itself. I'm sorry? Also taxes, but in this case, it's more. But you're from Ireland. Everything's about taxes, basically, <laughs> in a sense. That's why I'm from Ireland. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a reason for Ireland's existence in the face of the earth at this right. point in time. Right? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I love Ireland. But without the taxes? Mm -hmm. Here's the top 17 stockholders for GDF Swiss. Notice who the largest stockholders the French state. This is very similar to the Vale example where the government is the largest stockholder. Take a look at your top 17 stockholders. It could be that you could also have another state, in this, you know, the, the People's Republic of China be the largest stockholder. It does bring in this potential at least again of a conflict of interest. Okay? It's at the very end of this packet, I think. Or maybe it's right there. Different voting rights. <coughs> You know that until 2004 in the US, it was unusual. In fact, it was against New York Stock Exchange rules. If you wanted to be listed on the New York <coughs> Stock Exchange, you could not have two classes of shares. For about 50 years, from nine, I think Ford was given grandfather, didn't allow to have two classes. But for 50 years in the US, US companies had one class of shares. So Microsoft, Apple, all those companies are one class of shares. What happened in 2004? What's a company that went public in 2004 that changed the rules of the game? <coughs> in the US, that changed the rules of the game? Google. Google changed the rules of the game in a very bad way. One was that they had an auction setting, which I think is good, because why keep bankers in to, to do something that they really are not doing that well anyway? The other was Google introduced two classes of shares, class A and class B shares. 10 times of voting rights on class A shares as class B shares, and Larry, you know, Sergey Brin and Larry Page essentially control the voting shares. I remember when that happened, I thought there'd be a backlash from investors saying, you can't do this, we want voting rights. But guess what the reaction of investors <coughs> was? Doesn't matter. They're good managers. Remember the benign dictator? Thing? They're good managers, why does it matter? And once that door was opened, Every social media company since, except for Twitter, has had two classes of shares. Mark Zuckerberg owns 20% of Twitter shares, but controls 57% of its voting rights. Because he owns the voting shares. LinkedIn, you, know, you can go down the list. Every one of these companies has two classes of shares. And when I bring this up to institutional investors, it's amazing how blasé they are about this process. You say, what? Zuckerberg is a good manager. Why should we have, why should we care? I said, today you might not care, but there will be a time, maybe two years down, five years down, 
when Facebook is going to do things that you don't like and you're going to come back to me and say, Mark Zuckerberg is not listening to me. And my response would be the same as if you married Kim Kardashian <laughs> and complained about the fact that you got a lot of TV attention. They walk in with open, I mean in a sense, when you buy shares in a Facebook or a LinkedIn, recognize that the game is rigged. Same thing with Google. In fact, Google's gone further, right? They've had Class C shares. They thought, the Class B, you were actually too special already by giving you one tenth. Class C, you get no voting rights. Class D, which they created, I'm not even sure what that is. I'm afraid to even look. How do you get below zero voting rights? But Google seems to be exercising. How much can we abuse people and get away with it? And guess what? They're finding out they can dole out a lot of abuse because people are willing to look the other way if they're making money. Yeah. Family group company. Yes, yeah, go ahead. I think taking PC, how do you see that there's yeah. different voting rights on this page? Just you, you don't. Actually, you'd have to look at the description page and say class A or class B. Okay. Okay. So the, in fact, some companies, it's kind of behind the surface. You have to kind of dig. In the case of Facebook, you, you don't see it on this page. Who's doing LVMH? This company is an enigma wrapped in a... Remember the, how Winston <coughs> Churchill described Russia? It's like, it's a company that's almost impossible to break down. See, this is their corporate structure. What does it tell me? That this is... I don't even want to look inside that. This is the most complicated corporate structure <coughs> that I can think of. But the bottom line is, who runs LVMH? No, who no, makes no, the big no. decisions? Or no. So let's accept the fact that Bernie Arnault runs, that we are all bystanders in this process. And that's what I want you to focus on. Don't get too caught up in specific details. The question you're asking is, as a stockholder in this company, how much power will I have to institute change? And the answer in LVMH is none. Las Vegas sets. Largest stockholder is? Sheldon Atkinson. Who's he? He's the founder of the company. One of the things you notice in U.S. companies is initially the founder will be the largest stockholder, and as you go through time, the founder stock holdings will start to shrink. I'll give you an example. Twenty years ago, if you looked at Microsoft's top 17 stockholders, who was on top of the list? Bill Gates. He owned about 28, 27 percent of the shares. Today, if you look at Microsoft's top stockholders, Mike, I think Bill Gates owns 7, 8 percent of the company because he's funneled off the shares into the trust which has sold off the shares, raised the capital to do all the neat stuff he wants to do. But that's the nature of how fo founder holdings evolve in both the U.S. and Europe. Is as you go further and further away into time, the founder starts to get less and less critical, which in a sense is a healthy thing because the founder kind of distances himself or herself <coughs> from the company. Nadelson. He controls 51.49%. And that is a very dangerous number. You know why? Because it's just over 50%. You're saying, so what? It means that when Las Vegas Sands had to grow through much of the last decade, which is what they did. If you've seen the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, this huge monstrosity on the ocean. Or b these are huge casinos, each of which cost a billion. They had to come up with capital to build these casinos. You're at 51.5%. You have only one class of shares. <clears throat> See what this is going to make you do, right? Yeah. You're going to borrow money like crazy. Why? Because if you issue shares, you're afraid the 51.5% might become 49.5%. And this guy's paranoid to begin with. Las Vegas Sands almost drove itself into bankruptcy because of how much it borrowed between 2000 and 2007. Because when the 2008 crisis hit, in 2009, Las Vegas Sands came really close to the break. You're saying, but that was just a crisis. But it's also because they borrowed money to lead into the crisis. So sometimes as you look at these stock holdings, you get signals of what's coming just because of that control <coughs> aspect. Once in a while, the largest stock holder in your company can be another company. For a long time, the largest single stock holder in Kraft was Philip Morris. The largest single stockholder in JetBlue is Lufthansa. 
Two very different examples. Lufthansa, why does Lufthansa own a big chunk of JetBlue? It's not just as an investment holding, it's because it gives them a foothold in the airline business, the domestic airline business in the US. So when corporations hold pieces of other companies, sometimes it can be because they have operating benefits they get from these joint holdings. Sometimes it can be just as an investment. You think, so what? If I ask you who, where the power lies, and I'd ask you that question when Kraft was, I think Philip Morris owned 53% of Kraft. I said, where does the power lie? You know what you'd have to do? You'd have to go to Philip Morris and see who the stockholders in Philip Morris were, because in a sense, it's almost like they make the decisions that affect you as a company. Which brings me a final example. This is actually Dan, the French yogurt company. Why are you even looking at this company? If you go down the list, you'll see number 15 on the list is a fund called the Trian Fund. Trian, T-R-I-A-N. No? You know who that, who's the, who's the name behind that fund is? It's an activist investor in this case, and the activist investor and this is true for Carl, Carl I, you will never, might not see the name Carl Icahn on a list. You might not see the name Bill Ackman on a list. You'll see Pershing Square. I, if, if you go on my website, I have a listing of the 50 top activists invest in the U.S. and the fund names that go with each. And the reason you need to know that is sometimes when you look at your list, you want to see <coughs> these names on your list. Again, it's not because they're going to be pushing for something sensible that you agree with, but because they are the only counter force you have left against incumbent managers. So that's the focus of the exercise of looking at where the power lies. Yeah. Are there no watchdogs in the market to publish information about They are. The and all they do is these companies are run badly. So you like, I mean, I, this morning I published the 10 worst businesses in 2015. I list out what parts of the world companies earn well below their cost of capital. Guess what? China ranks one in terms of earning less than the cost of capital. Companies collectively in China earn 3.5% less than the cost of capital. So I'll publish the information, but now what? What are we going to do? We don't have the levers to push for change in China. All you can do is reprice these companies and move on. And, my, and sometimes that's all you can do with watchdogs is they can tell you these companies are badly managed and badly run, but they all have two classes of shares. Not much you can do. You reprice and go on. But the watchdogs can't change the companies. The change has to come from below. And it's got to start of the process. When an IPO happens, and you have two classes of shares in the company, and they're offering you these second class citizen shares, don't buy them. If you don't buy them, companies will start it. As long as we reward the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, with these high market caps, in spite of the fact that they abuse us as stockholders, why would they change? Yeah. Sorry, is that on your blog? The, uh, the activist investor list it is on my blog. I'll send you the link later today. Yeah. Yeah. Does the market react at the appearance of activist investor yes. among the investors? So the, the, the price rises? Yeah. The question was, uh, did everybody get the question? Is when a call I can shows up at a company, does a, how does the market react? Almost always positive. <coughs> Not because the market again agrees with what he's saying, but because it says, look, finally there's somebody <coughs> who's counterbalancing. Okay? In fact, I'm going to close with one final thing about the board of directors because I think that, I'm sorry. A lot of work that's been done in corporate governance for the last 20 years, as I said, has been about making the board of directors, so we're back to the regular election notes, I'm sorry. I, 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 I won't go back and forth too much, but no, I'll, I'll have to go back and forth somewhat. But a lot of the work over the last 20 years in corporate governance has been about how do we create a more independent board. That's all the focus has been. And what we're also discovering is research is showing that even if you create an independent board, over time, especially if you have a CEO who stays in place, the power shifts towards the CEO and the board. And it comes from two things. One is what they find psychologically is you tend to give power to who you think is the expert, somebody who knows more about the company. And almost by definition, a CEO knows more about the company. So if you're sitting in a room with nine other independent people and you're listening to a person who's the CEO of a company and he says, trust me, I know. 
I know this business, and then he says something. Even if we have no basis, we tend to kind of give that person more power than they should. So what they've discovered is even if you create independent boards, over time the CEO becomes the dominant power. So I've made a su you know, suggestion on corporate governance that nobody's going to take up, but I borrowed from the Catholic Church. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church had a problem. Too many people were becoming saints. Because what would happen is, somebody from some part of the world would say, we have a saint, and then the whole group would create, be created to push that person towards sainthood. And because there wasn't a countervailing force on the other side, the saint would make it. <coughs> Examples of miracles, you know, 17 miracles, whatever. Oh, you're a saint. So what did the Catholic Church create as a counterbalance? One of the great creations of all time. The devil's advocate. What's the job of the devil's advocate? To essentially act as a counterweight, saying that's not a miracle, that's a coincidence. That person is not saintly. Look, we found these. So think of them as the original <laughs> investigative journalists with powers. <clears throat> the devil's advocate essentially was designed. You say, what's this got to do with board of directors? I mean, I get a chairman of the board of directors. The chairman is all comes with all the powers. I think you almost need a counter CEO. Do you see what I mean? The CEO, so the CEO comes and says, this, I think this acquisition would be a great idea. We should do it. The counter CEO gets up and says, and he's given resources. So I don't think it's a good idea. You see, this is going to be a mess. I haven't thought this through entirely, but I think that the way we do it right now, it's almost by definition that bad decisions are going to flow through because the board is not going to be able to stop them. Yeah. That's like in politics. <coughs> that's exactly right. That's in a sense what we're saying is we need something in the board. It's almost with resources, right? Because right now, let's suppose a CEO wants to do an acquisition. He pulls out this phalanx of bankers who all come in with their presentations. And two hours later, you get a chance to ask questions. But they've already framed the debate. You're asking questions about details. In other words, the decision has already been made. You're almost an afterthought. If you had a counter CEO, you'd say, okay, you think that's a good deal? I'm going to hire my three. This was great for bankers, incidentally, because both sides will hire bankers. And you would present your counter argument. You could still make the decision. Yeah. As opposed to a counter CEO, <coughs> yeah. what a lot of countries have started to do yeah. is separate the role of CEO and chairman. But then you've got the to. Mandate is to right. that board is to hire and fire the CEO. How can you make the CEO chairman? And that's happening even in the U.S. Increasingly, the chairman and the CEO are being separated. But for that to work, the chairman has to be given resources. Going beyond, like, you control the agenda of the meeting. Resources in the sense of people who work for them who essentially will be able to collect data that you can use to check the numbers. Because right now, even if you're a chairman, you come to a meeting, the CEO presents all the numbers. This is what China is looking like. This is what the acquisition is looking like. And you can ask questions, but you don't have the resources, really. But the chairman can ask for a third party. or. And that, I think, is what's increasingly happening with activists, is they are, in fact, which is making them more like a counter CEO. So maybe that's what we need, is to institutionalize that process where the chairman feels that asking for resources is not viewed as something you're doing out of the ordinary, which is what it is right now, but something you do as a norm. So like, yeah. uh, do you mean like a budget control office like the government has, like an independent like office for the yeah, president? Yeah, but yeah, in a sense, something like that. Some, somebody to ask questions of big decisions, who has the resources to then test to see whether, in fact, that decision makes sense. Yes? One of the problems we have in the UK Mm -hmm. is that there is a liability that direct our right. John Mike. John Mike. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Um, in, in the UK, and I don't, I don't in know. In the US, too, you have a fiduciary responsibility yeah. as a director. Yeah. So, since the financial crisis, all of these things have been rank, uh, cranked up, and directors have a liability to shareholders, right. meaning that if you don't act in a the best way, interest of the shareholders. You, and, and it's categorized in seven or eight mm -hmm. different ways. Um, so, you own a financial liability, and you can be taken to court, you can be struck off, and you can be, you know, you can be sued. But the, <coughs> the, the counterfactual is that if you raise that bar too high,
then no nothing gets to done. be a director. Paralysis. And it's also you get paralysis, which is so every no, decision. So nobody would want to be a director if yeah. you so if you can imagine you're at that point now where the yeah. regulators have shifted the liability to a point where I don't want to be a director of a company because I don't want to own collective liability. So we, we the lawyers up. entered the room, so be very careful what you say about lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> We Thank were saying you. terrible things about lawyers while you were out. <laughs> Is he the only lawyer in the room? You're a lawyer too? Okay, then maybe you should no, get the... But I think, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And with my experiences with directors in the US, here's what's happened. Because the legal issue has become... Their decision making has become legally bound, which is they want the lawyer in the room with the big decisions, not am I making the right decision, but am, am I making a decision that's legally <coughs> defensible? Those are two different standards. And I think you're right. By making this a legal process, that's what corporate go governance has become. In one hand, rule writing, and the other, legal process. We've lost sight of what this is all about, which is we want better decisions to be made in businesses, not these decisions that are constrained by what's legally acceptable. But I think that's the problem with the way corporate governance has evolved. It's become legalistic on both the rule writing side and the way that these directors are held to. No. I'd prefer that we take it out of that process and make it about investors. Yeah. I don't know whether that's possible if investors stay passive, but that's what I would see as a more, you know, more productive end game. It, I mean, it's an interesting debate and yeah. one that, again, is linked to duration of the shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can come back to that because ultimately, you say most shareholders are ETFs, they're passive investors, they're flowing through, they don't care. And maybe, but all, I'm going to again argue that if you have a small subset of shareholders even who are longer term, Bill Ackman, for instance, has been in Procter & Gamble seven years now as an activist investor. This notion that activist investors hit and run is widespread, often spread by institutional investors. The typical duration for an activist investor is three times longer than the typical duration for an institutional investor. Okay? They, they, that's in terms of how many years they hold their investment. It's not everybody, but in a sense, you, you do need some pushback because you can't let managers set the agenda and make the decisions as if it were their money they were investing. Let me get to the point now. So we've kind of ripped apart all the assumptions that hold together traditional corporate finance, right? Stockholders have little power over companies. Managers do what they want. You lend money and you don't protect yourself. You get ripped off. You get Nabisco. Companies lie to markets all the time. Or if not, lie, hold back information, and markets don't always behave rationally and coolly. And there are social costs and social ben benefits bubbling under the surface. At this stage, you might be tempted to say, why are we even sticking with this objective of maximizing value when it's so flawed? So let's open the, the, the possibilities here. There are three things you can do if you don't like maximizing value. First is, you can pick a different mechanism for corporate governance. What does corporate governance require? Somebody has to have oversight over managers, right? Maybe stockholders are ill-equipped to do this. Maybe investors don't have the resources. Maybe somebody else should be doing it. And I'll give you a couple of counterexamples. Systems that have evolved without shareholder power where managers are kind of kept in line. So that's the first source. The second is, maybe the problem is this objective of maximizing value. Maybe we should focus on a different objective, maximizing revenue growth maximizing market share. The third is to return to maximizing value as an objective but try to build in some protections against the weakness in the point. You can already see what my, my preferred choice would be because everything I know about corporate finance is still built around value. So I'd like you to pick the third option but I'm going to try to be as open as I can about the first two choices. So let me start with the first choice, a different corporate governance mechanism. You go back to 1945. Germany and Japan as economies were in complete shambles. There was nothing there. Between 1945 and 1985, in true economic miracles, both countries <coughs> built themselves back up. So by 85, Germany was the second largest economy in the world. Japan was the third largest economy. And they built it using a very different structure than the UK and the US. The Japanese created what were called kairitsus. You know what kairitsus are? There are 50 companies held together by a cross-holding structure. And the way corporate governance worked in a kairitsu is if one of those 50 companies was badly managed and badly run, 
the managers of the other 49 would get together and replace the 50th manager. There was no room, no place for stockholders. It was all internally done. <coughs> Germany had its own version of Karitzos, usually at the bank in the middle. So Deutsche was the largest single stockholder in Daimler. Daimler was the largest single stockholder in Alliance. Alliance was the largest single stockholder in Deutsche, and they kept an eye on each other. And supposedly one of them got out of line, the other ones would pull them back. So it's a managerial system. It's a kind of an elitist system in a way as well, because what's the underlying message there? Stockholders are really ill-equipped to make these big decisions. We, the managers, know these businesses better. We will make the decisions. But it worked remarkably well. You didn't have hostile acquisitions. The kind of side costs you have with a stockholder-based system were not there. So by 1985, could be blamed for saying we should be more like the Japanese. In 1985, Japan was, in a sense, a pinnacle of success, of how a country could build itself up. And I remember Michael Porter, you know who he is? The Harvard corporate strategy guru, saying we should be more like the Japanese. And it sounded really good in 85. He suggested that U.S. companies should form cross-holdings like Karitsus. He said, let's cut off the power of stockholders. And it sounded good in 85. Then he got to the 1990s and he saw the downside of a Karitsus system. What's the downside? Remember the example I gave you of 50 companies where one company is badly managed and badly run? Let me change the example a little bit. Let's assume that 48 of those 50 companies have made bad real estate laws and two have not. Ask yourself, who's going to replace whom? Are the two going to replace the 48? Are the 48 going to get together and say, what's wrong with you? You're not a team player. Where are your bad real estate loans? You're fired. In 1992, U.S. banks and Japanese banks had roughly the same proportion of bad real estate loans on their portfolios. Now, whether anybody remembers the, the bloodletting that happened at U.S. banks in the early 90s when U.S. banks were, were forced to, in a sense, reveal how much they had to write off. They took their punishment. Their stock prices dropped, but they were able to move on. What did the Japanese banks do? They surrounded the wagon saying, what bad real estate loans? And 25 years later, you're still digging your way out of that complexity, the opacity they built to hide their mistakes. When you have top-down corporate governance systems, which is what Japan and Germany were, here's the price you pay. The people who make these decisions can be really smart people. The Ministry of Finance in Japan had some of the brightest people in Japan working for it. You have really bright people making decisions. But the problem with elitists is elitists. They hate to admit mistakes. Why? They, they were always the smartest people in the room. The people who are at the top of their classes. If they make a mistake, their tendency is to kind of defend that mistake to the end. I'll tell you this about markets. Markets have no egos. So six months ago, markets thought China was great. Now they don't. So what did they do? They knocked off 40% of the market cap. So if you're going to pick a top-down system, that's what I want you to think about. That's one of the costs. And you might say it's OK. It's a small enough cost. Because effectively, it means that you will deal with small problems much more efficiently. But system-wide problems? <clears throat> will persist. So that's the first choice. So think about choices there. And I think of the Chinese corporate governance system as a top-down system. You want to replace the management of a Chinese company, good luck to you. If there's change, it comes from Beijing down. And that's the way it is. And it's worked really well for a decade. How can you argue with it until it stops working? Here's the second choice. Maybe we can pick, yes. Just a quick one on yep. Germany. In Germany, this one has been unraveled and unraveled completely over the last... Yeah, and part of the reason is the bank in the middle is in trouble. Who wants to be connected to Deutsche anymore for the, for the near term, right? But it was well before that. It, it's, but I think it's, it's... You're right. It started to unravel about 20 years ago once you started to see the downside of the system. But across the world, this, these systems come into play. Every, every 20 years or so, there's one other country which comes with this top-down system, but things <coughs> work really well. And people say, we should be more like the Chinese. And then 10 years later, say, oh, thank God we're not like the Chinese. Right. Let's think about a different objective. Most of you work at companies where if you go back and look at the plans and the objectives they have over the next five years, it's not stated in terms of value. It's usually stated in something more concrete. We want to double revenues over the next five years. 
We want to triple profits over the next 10 years. We want to increase our market share from 10% to 15%. And you can see why the... And God help you if you call in a consulting firm in to tell you because they come with an acronym. All you need to do is maximize CFROI. What is that? Well, we can't tell you. You need us to tell you what it is. So every month we'll come in and tell you what your CFROI is. And you'll be okay. Oh, just maximize EVA. Most of the time it's just old wine in a new bottle. But effectively, these are replacements for this value concept. There's nothing wrong with picking an intermediate objective, which is what this is. Let me give you an example. Is, is a higher market share good for you as a company? Yes. Depends. Do you want 100% market share of a market we have to sell below cost? Well, who wants that? <coughs> market share makes sense if you can use that market share to actually make money, right? Get market power prices. Just don't let the antitrust guys know that that's what you're planning to do because that might get you into trouble. But the problem with focusing on an intermediate objective is it takes on a life of its own. Let me give you an example. 1981, American Airlines got a new CEO. A guy called Robert Crandall came in. Charismatic guy. And in his first press conference, he said, my objective at American is to make it the number one domestic U.S. airline. Number one domestic U.S. airline. And by 1989, he succeeded. It's the number one domestic U.S. airline in terms of number of passengers flown in the U.S. But there were only two airlines in 1989 that were making money. Neither of, neither of them was called American. One was Alaska Air, and it made money because nobody else wanted to fly to Fairbanks. And the other was the nascent Southwest. A very young Southwest. You know what it did? It flew Dallas to Houston, and Houston to Dallas. Dallas to Houston, Houston to Dallas. Why? Because it made money doing it. It said, we don't care about market share. We want to make money. That's not unusual. Market share, if you make that the front and center, everybody's going to make decisions driven by market share. When I go into banks, they always laugh at these examples. Oh, stupid airlines, they focus on market share. Then I ask them a question. When was the last time you saw a deal table? You know a deal table in investment bankers? They list out who the biggest deal makers were over the last quarter. It's like your life as an investment bank is driven by, did I make it to the top of the deal table? Was J.P. Morgan Chase top, or is it Goldman Sachs? And how do you get to the deal, top of the deal table? You do a lot of big deals. Not good deals, but big deals. Not surprisingly then, once you be that becomes your objective, I want to climb the deal table, you're going to be doing deals you shouldn't even be looking at. So if you pick a different objective, think it through to its logical consequences. And if you're okay with it, I'm okay with it too. I personally, I'm going to go back to a maximizing value objective because that's where I feel most comfortable. I agree with you. It's a flawed objective. It's actually a crappy objective. But it's the least crappy objective that I have among a lot of crappy objectives. And here's why I'm going to pick the objective. It's your only self-correcting objective function if you let it work itself through. Let me explain. What do I say stockholders do? They have very little power of managers. Managers put their interest over stockholder interest. Each time they do that, so you're the stockholders, I'm the manager. Each time I put my interest over yours, you're getting pissed off and more pissed off and more pissed off. There's a critical point I call the critical piss off point where you get so pissed off. You remember that network movie, the movie Network, where the guy says, I'm mad as hell and I won't take it anymore? You get to that point. I'm mad as hell and I won't take it anymore. He said, what are you going to do? You have only a thousand shares. I told you Carl Icahn is not the deepest thinker on in corporate finance. But here's his skill set. He finds companies where stockholders are hitting that critical point. Remember that proxy that came in that you were going to throw to the recycling or the trash? When you get really pissed off, you get that proxy. About two minutes after you get the proxy, you get a call from a proxy solicitation service. There are actually services in New York that Carl Icahn hires. They call you and say, look, you know, we just know you got that proxy. So how do you know we have our people? <laughs> it kind of scares you a little bit, so you keep on the phone. Okay. Would you be willing to give you a thousand votes over to Mr. Icahn to vote against managers? At this point, you're so pissed off, you'd give your vote, votes to Genghis Khan or uh, you know, Attila the Hun. You don't really care. Anybody but the existing guys. 
that's when you see activist investors pop up, is when you've made your stockholders mad enough that they're willing to, in fact, consider anybody but you. That's kind of a depressing thought. They're saying anybody but you can run the company better than you. <laughs> so that's the pushback. And at the extreme, you know what the typical target company in a hostile acquisition is? It's not a well-managed, well-run company. <laughs> it's a company that lags its peer group in terms of profitability, in terms of returns. You've made yourself a target. The best defense against hostile acquisitions is run your company well. It's amazing how well that's going to protect you. Because not only will it make your price go up, making you a more expensive company to buy, but when you go to your stockholders and don't sell to those guys, they're much more likely to trust you because you've earned their trust. That's a pushback if managers overreach. Remember the Nabisco example? You lent money to Nabisco and you got ripped off. Why did you get ripped off? is when they went and borrowed money, you didn't protect yourself, right? You didn't have any clause in there. Post Nabisco, more corporate bonds became puttable. You know what a puttable bond is? Essentially, if something like a le leverage buyout happens, you can do, put your bonds back to the company, they have to pay you face value. So in the case of Nabisco, you put your bonds in, you change the rules of the game, you're a double A rated company and I bought this, these bonds. You've done an LBO that made you riskier, that's not my fault, give me my thousand dollars back. Portable bonds. You saw special clauses, protection clauses show up in bonds after Nabisco. Too late to protect your Nabisco, but that's how bond markets deal with this fiasco of getting Nabisco pushback. You lie to financial markets. Eventually the truth comes out, right? And when the truth comes out, what happens? The stock price drops. But that's not all. That's just the first level of punishment. The second level is your credibility is shot to hell. And I'm going to make a statement that's going to sound weird. Remember I talked about you know, those financial balance sheets and assets in place and growth assets? If you're a mature company that gets a bulk of your value from assets in place, I can understand you playing accounting games. I don't condone it, but I can see why, you, why you're doing it. You want to report higher earnings, you play a few games. But if you're Snapchat and you play accounting games, it's absurd, right? It's what I never understood about Groupon. For those, you know, you're familiar with Groupon in the three and a half years? Who works at Groupon? Somebody works at Groupon? Hey. I'm sorry, right? But, but, <laughs> but this is the reality I face. Which is at Groupon, the problem I, uh, I saw at the company was it played all these silly accounting games. We're going to add back these expenses. And it, it really doesn't make sense. You're a growth company. I really don't care how much money I you got made this story. or lost last year. Yeah, but I asked this story to the CEO. And I asked him. Yes. This was when I Andrew very, Michael was CEO? It was, it? No, no, with the, yes, the, uh, the actual CEO. The, right. uh, just the one just left. So the, the one who set up the um, Eric Levovsky. Right. The guy who actually owned the company. And uh, it was, I think it was late or early in the morning I said at one point I need to ask you what happened <laughs> and uh, he said it was not his fault um, I think one of the guys at the board I think of Priceline they do accounting as a gross billing uh -huh. so some company like so some of these um, companies do gross billing accounting and when they ask him to the board they say hey do you want to join mm -hmm. the board I say no I cannot because you do net uh, you do um, you only take revenue and if I join your board it would impact my price so they said good faith that when they did it, they actually got the sign off from the, uh, from the auditors saying there is a risk. Some company do uh, revenue growth right. net and some of them do, do, um, do net is a huge gap. It's like right. three times more, but that's saying that the I never had an issue with the legality of what, they, what did. they did. My problem with them was that they were focused on the wrong thing. And you see what I mean by focus on the wrong thing, which is if 95% of your value, 90% of your value comes from your growth assets, then in a sense you're playing these silly games about the 10% that really don't drive my value. And by doing that, you're risking your biggest asset, which is you're telling a story, you need credibility. You don't want to risk that credibility. The pushback there is not only do you lose when bad things happen, it becomes very difficult for you to sell your story in the market because people don't trust you anymore. Social costs. And this is something we've danced around. <coughs> Let's say you're doing something that's legal, but is socially questionable. And I'll let you decide socially questionable. 
you're crossing that line between corporate good citizen to corporate bad citizen. You're in dangerous territory. In some businesses, you might be okay. But in other businesses, the blowback takes into lots of different forms. You remember when you had, I think, it, the Kathy Gifford episode? Kathy Gifford was, I think, selling clothes for one of the department stores, and it turned out the clothes were made of uh, underage labor in China. The pushback there was that <coughs> got to become a 60 minutes episode. Next thing you know, you'd lost 15% of your sales at your store. <coughs> Customers start buying your product. You and if you, I'm sorry. So do you think that Apple is going to be affected by the recent re revelations in terms of cobalt mining and other issues? I think it'll be, it's open. It depends on how attached we are to our iPhones. That's a reality. No, eh? And I think it's not fair, right? You can say, look, I don't want to buy it Sears, Kathy Gifford clothes. I'll go buy it Kmart. The, and that's why I think we want companies to be socially conscious. We've got to act like it matters to us. So you drive your SUV with your iPhone 6 and you carry a Monsanto backpack and, you know, and then you say, I am against all this stuff. It's not going to work if we want to make companies socially responsible. We've got to make it in their economic best interest to be socially responsible. Personally, I don't think Apple's going to be affected by these. I mean, all I need to do is stop 100 people's Apple's. Have you heard about the cobalt stuff? <coughs> Here's a what? What's happening? And then I describe it in there. Well, I really like my iPhone 6 a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if it gets to be a really big problem, then I will consider not upgrading. Not even switching to Android, but not upgrading. So I think it's, with Apple, I don't think it's as serious an issue. But the same reason why with Walmart, all that stuff didn't make a difference, because the kinds of people who buy at Walmart were not as impacted by those stories and the kinds of people who might have bought the gap in terms of special retailers. The kind, so it really depends on how much it costs you. In some business, it can cost you a lot. In others, it might not. But you don't want to end up being labeled as a bad corporate citizen. I talked about Vale. You've been reading probably about the dam collapse in, in Brazil, which is where I don't know how many people died, thousands of acres. And stories are seeping out that this is a, actually a joint venture between Vale and BHP. And the blowback to both is not just a legal blowback, the potential side cost. We'll have to play out to see how it happens. But that's the reason why, even if something is legal, I might hold back because the consequences of crossing over that line not only make you, you know, lose sales, but if you become a target, you become, get tarred as a bad corporate citizen. What happened to the tobacco companies for the last 25 years could happen to you? What happened to that? Well, any time in the U.S. a state wanted to raise taxes, guess what it did? Tobacco companies. And nobody came to their defense. Why? Because they were viewed as bad companies. So I think you want to be careful that you don't end up crossing that line, even if it's a legal line, and ending up being exposed to other stuff. <coughs> so let's go back to Disney. Remember I told you about Disney in 97? Eisner was king of the hill. He's emperor, imperial Caesar, because he'd been successful for 11 years. And that's one thing to remember. These are not bad CEOs. He started off as a really good CEO. He accumulated power. He ended up with this rubber stamp board. In 97, he ruled the world. So when he put together that board, I went back and looked through the news stories from then. Nobody was complaining about bad corporate governance at Disney. <coughs> And then Disney embarked on this five-year period where the stock price had an earnings drop. And you're saying, that's bad, it's bad. Like it was partially triggered by a big acquisition that Disney did in 96. You know who they bought? ABC. Cap Cities ABC. And they bought it because Eisner said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. They tried to play who wants to be a millionaire every day, seven days a week, but it didn't work. So over those five years, Disney lost half its value. And each year, the piss-off factor got higher and higher. In 2003, two of the directors on the board resigned. One was a guy called Stanley Gold. The other was a guy, it's, it's a symbolic resignation, this was a bit of a blow, was Roy Disney. And they resigned saying that Eisner was too autocratic, which everybody knew already, but now it come to the surface. In 2004, Comcast made, in my view, one of the most insulting acquisition bids in history. You know how you usually make an acquisition bid for a company, take the market price plus a premium? You know what Comcast offered? Market price discounted. 
They said the market price is 32, we'll pay. In other words, this was really not a serious acquisition. It was just a, an insult. So you guys are so ill-regarded that investors will sell their shares for less than the market price just to get you out of the game. And they were probably tempted. Finally, in 2005, the pressure had built up to the point where that board, that rubber stamp board, finally said, you got to go. Nobody likes you anymore. Nobody wants you around. What I'm trying to say is when you get managers moved out, it takes a lot of anger from below building up to a point where it blows up. In fact, he was replaced by a new CEO, a guy called Bob Iger. And he was, it's amazing, it's like politics. You often replace a powerful figure with somebody who's the exact opposite of that figure. He was actually the anti-Eisner when he came in. Guy with a small ego, didn't want power put together a board that looked much more. And initially, he actually made the company a much more democratic company in terms of listening. Disney rose in the corporate governance standards. It, it's, I think it became the second highest ranked company in the corporate governance course, you know, much as I distrust those scores. And it looked like Iger really meant it when he said, this is not my company, I'm just the CEO of the company. And he really meant it when he said, I'm running this company for shareholders. In fact, in 2011, he announced, though there was a little bit of a snafu when he tried to come, the board said, let's combine the chairman and the CEO. But to kind of counterbalance that in 2011, Iger said he was going to step down and that he'd like an orderly transition because the company was more than him. He said, there must be other people who could run the company. It's all good so far, right? And Eisner, he actually wants to step down on his own. Well, here's where things get interesting. In about 2014 or 15, the board went back to Iger and they said, you really can't leave the company. You're too important. And initially his reaction was, no, 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 I'm not that important. You can find somebody else. Then they ask him a second time. So no, 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 you can find somebody else. Have you seen Julius Caesar, the, the Shakespeare version? They offer him the crown the first time. He says, no, no, no. Second time, no, 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 no. That's too much for me. Third time, okay, put it on my head. Okay? <laughs> so the third time they ask, you know, you're, you're right. I am too important for the company. A depressing thought. Here's a guy who came in with a low ego. Ten years later, he's behaving more and more like an imperial Caesar. You know how in politics you have uh, these, these, in some countries you have these restrictions, like the US, you can't be president for more than two terms. It's put into law. Maybe we need something with CEOs where at a certain point in time, it's time for you to go. Okay? Something to think about. So that's the objective function, as I said, it's going, to, it's going to be at the background of almost everything we talk about through the next two and a half days. So if you disagree with me stringently or you know, strongly about some topic, it's probably not because you don't like net present value. It's because you disagree with the core objective. And that's fine. Just go back and say, this is why I think you run businesses. It's not to maximize value, it's to maximize revenue growth, maximize market share. And then you can think about what the source of the disagreement is. So now let's get to the meat and potatoes part of corporate finance. I mean, this is a philosophical part that we've just completed. Let's talk about risk and return. Yes? Yeah? What about cooperatives? What about cooperatives? Who owns a cooperative? The customers do, right? So in a sense, that's a different objective model. So basically what you have is profit sharing that takes the form of Lower prices for cost. Nothing wrong with that. Okay? So you have to then define your objective as minimizing the overall cost to your customers and think about how do we do things. So a co-op is actually a fairly straightforward entity to value because it is owned by the customers. The line between customers and owners is then gone. It means you don't have to charge the profit margin. The only problem is then you better close the store to just co-op members, right? The co-ops that leave the doors open then end up subsidizing other people because then you have lower costs. Why? Because your owners are, get, but other people are buying your stuff. And that's where I think a lot of co-ops run into trouble is because if you don't restrict it to co-op members, then you have profit sharing with people who did not contribute to the game. So I think almost any entity you can structure around a central objective. Right. Some 
Right. A co-op insurance company, for instance, is supposed to take its profits and lower the premium for all its members, right? Yeah. So in a sense, that if you're not doing that, then you're playing the co-op game just in lip service. A lot of co-ops are really not co-ops. They like to use the co-op game to hide. There might be regulatory benefits you get, tax benefits you get, but really, if you're a true co-op, all your profits, is, your profit should be zero because in a sense, your prices for your products should basically reflect it. You might keep some kind of a provision, like any insurance company, because you need to cover future contingencies. But it should all feed into your product prices, because the consumers are now your stockholders. Let's talk about the investment principle. Let's start with a core question, right? Basically, I'm, you're going to see this picture show up over and over again, because at every stage of the process, this is where we are in the big picture. So we've talked about the objective. Now let's talk about the hurdle rate. It should reflect that riskiness the hurdle rate should reflect the riskiness of what you invest in and should reflect where you get the money to take that investment. So let's set, the, let's set up the process. Every investment needs a hurdle rate. When I say hurdle rate, here's what I mean. There's a benchmark that you need to make. So this is not even what you need to make to be happy. This is what you need to make to just break even. So here's how I'm going to structure it. I'm going to say that every investment, the hurdle rate, is going to be built off two components. One is what you would make on a guaranteed investment, and I'd like you, like you to start thinking about that. We can call it a risk-free rate, but essentially, what would you make on a guaranteed investment plus a risk premium? And the core question we're going to try to examine is how do we come up with that risk premium for an investment? So to address that question, I need to answer two sub-questions. The first is, what exactly do we mean when we say risk? So I'm going to start with that question. You might say, I know the answer already, but you'll be amazed at how much diffuse, how many diffuse answers you can get to that question. And how do I convert that risk measure into a, into a premium? So let's start with that first question. So I'm going to throw that question out to you. What is risk? Yes, Uncertainty. We now replace one nebulous word with another nebulous <laughs> word, right? Because it asks you what, and this is actually the, in fact, in the economics, they do this dance where they draw a difference between uncertainty and risk. Frank, you know, this goes back over 100 years, where uh, Frank Knight, an economist, said, uncertainty is risk you cannot measure. Which is this, only economists can dance these dances. What, I don't even know what that means, you know. Versus risk is something you can measure. But the problem, with, uh, so I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure that it's got me further down the road, right? The price relative to pay. The price? Relative to pay. That's, no, that's what you're willing to pay for risk. But your, the price you're willing to pay comes from some perception of risk. Of failure. Mm -hmm. Probability of failure. Probability of failure. So let's start with that. Already you're saying that risk is a bad thing, right? It's not just unknown, it's, it's, the downside that you worry about, not the upside. So again, we're, we're starting to dig. Like the desired outcome doesn't materialize. Okay, that's a more open definition of risk because the desired, or the actual outcome can be much better or worse. So you're saying it's not just downside, it could also be it's also upside. Opportunity. So it's, it's what? An opportunity. We'll talk about that. It's an opportunity only if you're willing to live with the downside and the upside, right? Uh, the risk of the uh, project on the various outcomes. Which is, you know, which is, again, a variant of what he says, which is the actual outcome on a project can be different from the expected. So I hear two, two different views of risk. One is that it's a bad thing. It's downside. The other is any time the actual outcome is different from the expected outcome, it's risk. In finance, it's the second definition of risk that's going to rule. Risk is not good. Risk is not bad. Risk just means that your actual outcome can be different from the expected outcome. The very best definition of risk, and this goes back to what Stephanie said, is actually the Chinese symbol for crisis or big risk. I know no Chinese, so I have to be careful. This could be something of, you know, obscene for all I know. <laughs> I've been told that this is the Chinese symbol for risk, and the Chinese symbol for crisis or big risk is a combination of two symbols. Danger plus opportunity. It's the perfect way to think about risk. Risk is not good. Risk is not bad. Risk is a combination of danger and opportunity. You know why I like this definition? It connects them at the hip. It says if you want one, you've got to be willing to live with the other. I mean, who amongst us doesn't want opportunity? We all want to make 80% returns, right? And they say, how much danger are you willing to face? Says, no, I don't like danger. And they say, no, then don't ask me for 80% returns. 
Think of how many mistakes in business and investing would be avoided if we remember this linkage. Because here's what happens. We get greedy and then we get stupid in that order. We want the upside, but we want the downside. So when somebody comes up to you and says, well, you can take this investment with no risk and you make 25%, part of you says, that can't happen. And then the other part of you says, but this could be the once in a lifetime. In fact, I'll tell you a story of what happens when the two words disconnect. Anybody here from Orange County, California? No? Have you been to Orange County, California? It's Anaheim, Disneyland. I love Orange County, California. But 20 years ago, Orange County declared bankruptcy. The entire county. Why? Because the treasurer of the county took a third of the money in the pension fund for the county and bet on interest rate futures in Germany. I don't make up this stuff. <laughs> so he loses a third. No, bank. Huge story. He's on 60 Minutes. And Mike Wallace was one of those old time you know, tough questions on 60 Minutes. So this is the actual interview in 92. So this guy's name, the, the treasurer of Orange County, his name is Robert Citrin. I think everybody in Southern California makes up a name. There is no way this guy's real name. It's Get it, Citrin, Orange County. You know. <laughs> this is like saying Wolf Blitzer. Have you ever seen this guy on CNN? Wolf Blitzer, defense. Co Come on. <laughs> it's probably, you know, what is it, Joe Smith, but you change your name to Wolf Blitzer because it sounds more, you know. But so this is the, 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 the interview, and you know, Mike Wallace says, Mr. Citrin, why would you take pension fund money that's supposed to be invested safely and speculate on interest rates in Germany? And here's what Robert Citrin says. Because Charlie Klo told me I could make 25% with no risk. To which your response is, who the heck is Charlie Klo? And why is he telling you these things, right? Charlie Klo was the market strategist at Merrill Lynch. In fact, Merrill was a co-defendant on the lawsuit that came out of this. Now, I don't know Charlie Clough, but I do know market strategists. Have you ever, ever heard a market strategist talk? These are the slipperiest people on the face of the earth. <laughs> They're incapable of making a direct statement. You can listen to, for two hours to market strategists. At the end of the talk, he said, what did he say? <laughs> I thought he said he, stocks would go up. No, no, I think he said it, they'll go down. No, I think they're free. No matter what happens, he's covered. So let's say Charlie Clough, in a moment of weakness or when he was drunk, did actually say this. You can make 15% with no risk. Or 25% with no risk. Do you have, and, and let's go back to the interview. Here's what Citroen says. And I'm not a finance person. What, what's your job again? It's a treasurer of a county. I thought that required some, but I guess you got, it's a political position. You got elected as a very good politician. But do you need to be a finance person to know that if somebody walks up to you and says, you can make 25% with no risk, is that lying? If you really think you can make 25% with no risk, you probably also think that that Rolex you bought on Canal Street last week for $45 <laughs> is really a Rolex. Trust me, if you paid $45 for a Rolex, it's not a Rolex. In fact, it says R-O-L-E-C-K-S. Sometimes you get the spelling, right? Okay. You're making 25%, there is risk. You can choose not to face it or to, you know, you can, but you can't tell me there's no risk. So one way to think about what we do in finance is we're trying to measure the danger in investment and we're asking how much opportunity do I need to compensate me for the danger I'm exposed to. That's it. So I'm going to take you through everything I know about risk and return models in finance and put it into one page. And actually it's not that difficult to do because the first two steps in building up risk and return models in finance are exactly the same for every risk and return model. We start off by defining risk as the deviation of actual returns around an expected return. Sounds abstract, right? Let me give you three examples to bring home exactly what I'm talking about. Let's say you're an investor with a one-year time horizon, and you buy a one-year T-bill today. And let's assume for the moment the US Treasury has no default risk. Again, I have to keep saying that over and over again, because it is an assumption. Let's say right now the one-year T-bill is priced to yield 0.2%. So you have a one-year time horizon, you just bought a one-year T-bill. 0.2%. A year from now, I come and knock on your door <coughs> and ask you, what did you make on that investment? Assuming you held it through the year, your return is going to be 0.2%. That is a riskless investment. You make exactly what you thought you would make 
every scenario. <coughs> Let's move one step up the ladder. <coughs> Let's say you buy stock in Procter & Gamble. It's your company. You're realistic. You say, I expect to make an 8% return. <coughs> one year from now, I come and knock on your door. If you were lucky, what might have happened? You might have made 12, 13, 14, 15, but you're not going to make 100%. This is not the kind of company that's going to double. If you're not, you might have lost you know, 2%, 3%, but you're not going to lose 80%. So actual returns different from the expected return, riskier than the one year deal. One step finally up the ladder. You decide to buy stock in GoPro. Go to the company. High flyer, action cameras for overactive shares. Basically, you record everything you do and put it on YouTube as if everybody wants to go on a walk with you for four hours. Okay. It's a stock that used to trade as high as $80 per share. It's now trading at $15 per share. He said, this is the time. You're a contrarian. You buy GoPro expecting to make a 20% return. Expecting. If you're lucky, what might happen? It could double. It could quadruple. You could make 300% returns. If you're not, it could go to zero. Again, actual returns different, but much. you see what I'm oh, in, with how ri when I talk about risk, it's always in the future. There is no risk in the past. It sounds like stating the obvious, but here's why I said it. If I ask you how risky is Procter and Gamble, what are you trained to do after a finance class? You run to the computer, you look up the risk of Procter and Gamble, and how is that risk measured? By looking at what the stock did last year, two years ago. In other words, all our data on risk is backward looking. All our worries about risk are forward looking. It's a conundrum we've got to come back and deal with when we talk about how to measure the risk of a company. Is everything we see is in the past, but everything we worry about is in the future. But that's the first step in the process, the deviation of actual risk. So if you are classifying these investments, the table would be riskless, Procter and Gamble would be riskier, GoPro would be even riskier. It's pretty intuitive. So the more companies' actual returns move away from expected returns, the risk here it is. Second step is where I'm going to ask you to kind of hang in there. When you invest in GoPro or Disney, let's take Disney as a company, you're exposed to lots of different risks. Like what? Well, you could be exposed to the risk that, uh, what's the next big budget movie coming out? No, it's, uh, whatever it is, no, Snow White or no, what, I think Sleeping Beauty. Some, one of them is coming out as a real movie rather Jungle than Book. an animated movie. Jungle Book. Jungle Book. What is it? Jungle, Jungle Book. Book. Okay, Jungle Book. Big budget movie. I think the latest estimate is going to be a $150 million movie. It could be a huge hit. Or it could be the next Lone Ranger. Those of you not familiar with the Lone Ranger, this was the movie where they put Johnny Depp as the Lone Ranger. Forgive me, but every time I see Johnny Depp, I see the pirate. In the Caribbean. <laughs> this guy is so stereotyped that no matter what role he plays, I'm saying, when is he going to pull out a sword? <laughs> and obviously that movie they cost like 200 million to produce, produce only 35. So it could be a huge failure, it could be a huge hit. So that's the first risk, risk that the next movie. They're spending a billion dollars in California Adventure, the Anaheim theme park, building a new Star Wars section. The problem they've always had with California Adventure, which is right across the brick walkway from Magic Kingdom, is when they built a California Adventure, they thought that 65% of the people who went to Magic Kingdom would come to California Adventure. That's how they built it. Turned out in hindsight that only about 40% have been making it, so California Adventures had a tough time making it, and every two years they keep throwing another billion in, hoping that this would be the tipping point. They did it with cars a few years ago, now it's, it could work, and maybe Star Wars will draw people in, but it might not, so the risk is that that might fail. The, when you look at Disney's different businesses, you know what the biggest chunk of value for Disney comes from the one part of Disney that create, that accounts for about 40 percent? Or oh, cruise ships are like penny change for them. ESPN. 40 percent of Disney's value comes from ESPN. You know why? It's the most incredible cash cow in the broadcasting business. How many of you are US based? And how many of you have cable? Take a look at your cable bill. It's like what? $120 of opacity, right? But what? You get these 700 channels, 691 of these you've never even seen. And the way these channels get lined up in a cable network is they pay the cable, or the cable company pays them to carry the channel. 
So the food network might pay 25 cents or 50 cents. I mean, the, the cable company might pay 50 cents to carry the food network. CNN might be 75 cents. And then there's ESPN. Every cable bill in the US, $7 of that cable bill each month goes to ESPN. You think, why do they have so much bargaining power? It's the only thing that is between cable and the abyss. You know what the abyss is? The abyss is what my 26 year old son does, which is he's cut the cable and he has Hulu, Netflix, and three other things, and he's done. But the reason he's able to get away with it is he doesn't watch live sports, my older son. So he's okay with it. But if you want to watch live sports, you still need cable, and ESPN is that. that. So ESPN has this tremendous cash drawing power, but there's a problem. As more and more people, especially younger people, are cutting the cable link, that value for ESPN, which I've estimated to be about as high as 40 billion, could become 25 billion. Or maybe they'd reason discover a new way of streaming. So the risk with ESPN is good things could happen. You see what I'm saying? Basically, there are risks at the company level on things they do that might or might not work. You can also have risks that are more general. So every time the dollar moves, gets stronger. Is Disney affected? When the dollar gets stronger, the theme park attendance drops off. Why? Because those people who used to fly from Latin America, from Brazil, basically the price of a Disney ticket has doubled. One of the worst investments I made was a year ago when I left Brazil. I left 50 reais in my pocket. <laughs> it's still in my pocket. Okay? When I go back, it'll still be in my pocket, but I've lost 50%. So that basically the RIA was about 220 reais per dollar when I when I left the year and a half ago. Now it's like four something and it's dropping by the moment. So every time the dollar strengthens your rep. So when you're investing in Disney, you're affected by risk of these individual projects, you're affected by the dollar getting stronger or weaker. The level of interest rates overall, it's China. I mean you can take a there are a whole stream of different risks you're exposed to as an investor. You think so what? Not all risk is going to get rewarded. That sounds like a weird thing. I'm exposed to it. Why shouldn't I? Because some of that risk can get averaged out. This is not a finance concept. It comes from statistics. It's called the law of large numbers. What it means is if you own 30 or 40 companies, on some of those companies, on individual projects, things will do better than expected. So for every Lone Ranger movie at one company, there'll be a Star Wars hit at another company. That's all the law of large numbers says. As you get more diversified, risks that are company specific will get averaged out. That is called the Harry Markowitz revolution, but it's really common sense. So here's what we assume in finance, and it's an assumption. We assume that the marginal investor, and I'll come back and talk about who the marginal investor is. The marginal investor in a company is diversified, holds more than one company, and because the marginal investor is the one who sets prices and prices risk, the risk that gets priced into public companies is the risk that you cannot diversify away. I'll make it really simple. The risk that you cannot diversify away tend to be macro risks, not micro risks. Macro risk, interest rates, inflation, what happens in China. Those are macro risks. Those you cannot diversify away. You know what the market's been doing today? Don't look if you don't want to know. Okay? It's down 500 points. You say, but I'm a diversified investor. It's not going to help you today. Because it's macro risk that's driving prices down. And that risk you cannot eliminate. That's the risk you get rewarded for. It's a really <coughs> troublesome concept because it's built on the premise of that marginal investor being diversified. One of the things we're going to talk about is, what if that's not true? And there are companies where that's not going to be true where you have to price in more than just the macro risk, but that's the driving force for how every risk and return model in finance thinks about risk, which means that now we have to measure that exposure to macro risk. And that's where the different risk and return models in finance part ways. Let's start with the oldest risk and return model in finance. It's called the CAPM. You've seen it, right, already? I'm not going to go through the mechanics and the derivation of the CAPM. I couldn't, be, I couldn't care less. Let's cut to the intuition behind the CAPM. The notion that diversification is a good thing is not new, right? It didn't start with Harry Markowitz. Remember the old proverbs, don't put all your eggs in one basket? That's a diversification argument. So as long as people have been investing, spread your bets out. 
And you can give a statistical proof, but it's basically the more you spread things out, the less you're exposed to those individual company problems. And statistically, I can show you that if you keep diversifying, your benefits will drop off with every additional investment, but it doesn't matter. Even the 100,000th investment will still reduce your risk a little bit. But most of us stop diversifying at some point, right? Like, how many stocks did I say I had in my portfolio? About 53. Might be 52 by the time I'm done today, or zero by the time I sell everything in a panic. But 53. Why did I stop at 53? Give me the cruel answer first. No, the cruel answer is you don't have enough money. Right? So let's get that out of the way. You're right. I'm not a billionaire. I had to stop at 53 because now the... The effectiveness of balanced portfolio doesn't affect anymore because the weightage is... It always affects with the marginal benefit. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So give me the other side of the equation. I've got to weigh it against a... There is a cost, right? The transactions cost, a bit as spread. It's relatively small. With E-Trade, I pay $9 per trade, but still there's a cost, and there's a cost of monitoring. And so at some point in time, the costs exceed the benefits. So I stop because the costs exceed the benefits. You know the other reason I stopped? Who amongst you wants to be an average investor? You go into a cocktail party and says, I'm an average investor. See how many people gather around you for anecdotes. <laughs> we all want to beat the market, right? Even though we never reveal it. Inside, it's oh, better than average. These dumb people around. I can beat them. You know, in my school district, this statistic came out last last week. Ninety-nine point three percent of the students in my school district are above average. <laughs> I'm trying looking at that statistic. Said ninety-nine point three percent. Who is this really, really stupid kid? In the <laughs> Who's pulling? I mean, there must be somebody with a negative IQ, <laughs> with a GPA which is minus five thousand. <laughs> But you can see why the school district wants to say, your kid's above average. What parent ever complains about having an above average? We all want to be above average. So the second reason we stop is because we think we can pick good stocks. For better, whether it's true or not, whether it's based in reality, I stopped at 53 because I thought I'd found the 53 best companies for me. This might be a complete delusion, but the two reasons we stop are transactions costs and because we think we can pick the right stocks. Let's go back to the CAPM. The first two big assumptions of the CAPM are no transactions costs and no private information, which is a euphemism for you don't know what's cheap, what's expensive. So now, if you introduce those two assumptions, when should I have stopped? Not at 53, not at 500, not at 5,000, not even at 41,889. I should have had every publicly traded stock. But then I should have had every pub. In fact, I should have not stopped till my portfolio included a small piece of every single traded asset in the market. You think that's crazy. But it's a logical end product of the two assumptions, right? So I'm going to end up with a portfolio that owns a small piece of everything in the market. What should we call that? Or oh, let's call that the market portfolio. How creative. <laughs> and we all end up owning it because. There are no transactions costs and no private. So this, if this were the entire market, we'd all end up holding. Think of this as a gigantic index fund. It's actually not that unreal, right? Think of it as a gigantic index fund that owns a small, and that's all each of us is going to hold. At which point you get a puzzle, because let's face it, we're, risk aversion varies across people in this room, right? So he might want to take no risk, you might want to take some risk, you might want to take even more, and she might be even more risk taking. So how much are you going to put in that market portfolio? In the you, you want to take no risk, you're going to put nothing in the market portfolio, put everything into riskless assets. So you're easy. You want to take some, you put 50% in the market portfolio, 50% in the riskless. You want to take even more, you put all your money in the market portfolio. But now we have a problem. She wants to take even more risk in the cap M. What's the logical way for her to take risk? Well, Borrow money and buy the same market portfolio. Well, got really simple, only two 800 numbers in your speed dial, one for that bank with the riskless asset, one for the gigantic index fund, you go bang, 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 you're done. But once we get there, measuring risk becomes incredibly trivial. Because now when I come to you with a Disney, you know how you measure risk? You measure the risk as the risk added to the market portfolio. And how do we capture that? We look at the past returns for Disney against the market portfolio. When you, when you use betas, Think of all the baggage you're carrying in with you. 
because that's what beta measures is the risk added to a market portfolio and it's built on the presumption not just that the marginal investor is diversified but there are no transactions cost and no differences in information that was 1964 Bill Sharp and John Lindner won the Nobel Prize in capital for 14 years it was the only game in town until 1978 when a professor at Yale Steve Ross said this is crazy I said, this market risk comes from lots of different macroeconomic sources, interest rates, inflation, GDP growth. He said, why do we have one beta trying to capture all these risks? Why don't we allow for multiple sources of market risk and have a beta against each one? Sounds logical, right? When we first came up with the idea, people said, that's nice, but how will we know how many <laughs> sources of market risk there are and what the beta is? He said, that's easy. Give me a really powerful computer and 50 years of stock price data. You see where you're going next? How do I define market risks? It's risk that affects most or all companies at the same time, right? He sent the computer on a search mission through the data. Say, find common pat patterns in the data. It's called a factor analysis. What the computer does is scroll through the data, say, okay, these 650 stocks seem to move together 25 times in the, in the data series. So I'm going to call that factor one, factor two. At the end of a factor analysis, you come back with two pieces of output. One is the computer says, I found five factors in the data. And here comes the bonus. It gives you the beta for each company against each factor. So when I ask you how risky is Pepsi, these are the betas against each of the five factors. That's called the arbitrage pricing model. When it came out in 1978, people thought it was a godsend. Much better than the CAPM, different. Beta. And I'll tell you why it never saw, it never caught on. And I'll use the example of the first investment bank that actually tried to use the arbitrage pricing model with clients, which is Solomon. So you're Solomon. I'm Pepsi. You show up in my office. You say, you have a new model. The APM, not the CAPM. Acronyms always work. Say, so you plug this in. We have this new model. We plug the numbers in. Your cost of equity is 22%. I'm shocked. Hmm, this is late 70s, my cost of equity is high, but not 22%. It's always 18%. So why is it so high? And you tell me. You tell me it's because I'm really sensitive to the second factor. What's the logical next question you're going to get from me? What's, What's the second factor? factor? You said, I don't know, but be very careful when it's around. <laughs> See what happened? <laughs> when, when the computer did the factor analysis, it came back with five factors, right? It's a statistical model, not an economic model. So what did it call the factors? Factor 1, Factor 2, Factor 3, Factor 4, Factor 5. An arbitrage pricing model doesn't name the factors. Because it's a statistical model. Now do you see why I'm not going to buy the 22%? I throw you out. For long you walk back to your office, which is 100 miles away. And as you walk, you think about why your pitch failed. When I asked you what the second factor was, you couldn't give me a name, right? <coughs> so there isn't the solution. If you could somehow put macroeconomic names on the five factors, your problem goes away. So for the next three years, Solomon spent millions of dollars, and academics kind of helped in the process, trying to put macroeconomic names to the factors by looking at past data. Sounds fancy, but when you do a factor analysis, you actually get graphs of each factor over time. So think of looking at the, that looks a lot like interest rate, that looks like the term structure. They've put names on the factors. It took them three years and many millions, they got the names. When you put macroeconomic names on those factors, you've gone from an arbitrage pricing model to what's called a multi-factor model. So by the mid-80s, you have these multi-factor models. So you're ready? You come back into Pepsi and say, well, I've replaced that arbitrage pricing model you didn't like with a multi-factor model. Your cost of equity is 21%. I say, well, that sounds high still. What's happening? So you're really sensitive to the second factor, but this time you're ready for my question. In fact, if I don't ask the question, you'll ask yourself the question. What's the second factor? You tell me, it's oil prices. I said, what? We don't use oil in Pepsi. It might taste like we do, but <laughs> what, what do we have? You see what happened? Those, those mathematicians and statisticians fit the factors by looking at the past. In the 1970s, obviously, were a period where oil prices. So they did their job of fitting the macroeconomic factors but they fit them for the past. And the problem is by the time you got to 85, oil prices were no longer one of, and that's always been the weakest link in multi-factor models. It's great to fit a backward-looking multi-factor model, but in terms of predictive powers? So in each stage in the process, when people say, this is the model that beats a CAPM, you're failing. Arbitrage pricing model drops, multi-factor model drops. 
Then you get to the 1990s. And two professors at the University of Chicago, Gene Farm and Ken Friend, said, this is crazy. Why are we even trying to build these models? We want a hurdle rate, right? So why don't we just look at the past to see what kinds of companies have earned high returns in the past and what kinds of companies have earned low returns in the past. Do you see what they're doing? They're looking at 50 years and these. And then they made a leap of faith. They said, if, if these companies make high returns, it must be because they were riskier. Do you see why it's a leap of faith? And this is what they found. They found that small market cap companies earned higher returns than large market cap companies. And they made the leap of faith. Small companies must be riskier than large companies. They found that companies where the market price was much lower than the book value of equity earned much higher returns where, than companies where the market price was much higher than the book value of equity. And they said that must mean low price to book ratios is a proxy for risk. I call these proxy models because in a sense they, you've given up on measuring risk. You're letting something else stand in. They're almost fatalistic because if you're a small company with a low price to book ratio, you know what kind of cost of equity you're going to have? A really high one. You can show me your earnings and show me how stable they are. Is it too bad? And over the last 20 years, people have added more proxies, but the proxy models, basically you look at the past and you try to build up from that. Fifty-two years after the CAPM came out, you walk into any corporation, you walk into any investment bank, you walk into any consulting firm, you look at how they estimate their hurdle rates. Guess what you're going to see? You still see the CAPM. I still use the CAPM in my valuations. And when I do this at a company, there's always somebody. The less they know, the more dangerous they become on this issue. Who put up his hand and say, last week in The Economist I read that the CAPM was dead. The CAPM is killed and buried. I'm sorry, The Economist is killed and buried, the CAPM, I think at least a dozen times in the last 40 years. CAPM has died more often than Freddy Krueger has. <laughs> but just like Freddy Krueger, every Halloween, it's back again. So when you look at the critiques of the CAPM, here are the three levels at which you can be criticized. The first is that the model makes unrealistic assumptions. Does it? Absolutely. No transactions cost, no private information. You know what? That doesn't bother me in the least because I used to be an econ major in a previous lifetime. And remember those realistic models in econ classes? Usually built around the second derivative of the utility function to wealth. With these great models. And then you raise your hand and you ask the econ professor, well, how exactly would I observe the second derivative of the utility function to wealth? And he says, nobody's ever done it before, but once you do it, it's all going to be clear. Given a choice between a model that makes unrealistic assumptions that I can use and a model that makes realistic assumptions that nobody can use, it's a no-brainer for me. I'll take the unrealistic model. But I can look. Then the second critique will be from the coward in the last row. He put up his hand and say, what if you made a mistake? And what? Your beta could be wrong. Your risk premium could be wrong. To which my response is, that's all you think I got wrong? <laughs> you should see my revenues, my margins, my earnings, my growth. They're all wrong. You know why they're wrong? Because they're in the future. If you tell me that the only model you will use is the one that I can guarantee you is right, then none of these models are going to work. So that's an easy critique. It's a third critique that cuts to the bone. If the cap M is the right model for risk. The only thing that should be cause differences across stocks is betas. So if I take 50 years of returns and I look at returns across different companies, 100%, think about that, 100% of variation across stock returns over a very long period should be explained by differences in betas. Look at that Pharma French paper I talked about. They started their paper by asking the question, how close to 100% do we get when we look at differences in returns across 50 years? Now I'll tell you, it's not even close. It's not 90, it's not 80, it's not 50, it's 8%. 8% of the variation returns across stocks over very long periods is explained by differences in betas. That's a truly scary number. And we're building a model on this 8%. So when this is when I'm going to give you an anecdote. The advantage of the anecdote is by the time you finish the anecdote, people will forget the question and you can move on. So feel free to use this anecdote to defend the cap M. It's about these two guys who go camping. It's late at night, they're sitting around a campfire way up in the forest. And they hear the sound of a crazed grizzly coming at them through the forest. So one of them 
gets into a sleeping bag, zips up, gets ready to die. I don't know what form this takes. The other guy starts jogging, warming up, jogging in place. The guy in the sleeping bag says, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to run. The guy in the sleeping bag says, don't be crazy. You can't outrun a grizzly. They run 55, 60 miles an hour when they're crazed. The guy is warming up says, look, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. All I have to do is outrun you. It's a morbid thought, but think about that. The CAPM is an awful model. Accept it. And remember what Milton Friedman said, it takes a model to beat a model. If you don't like the CAPM, fine, tell me what you're going to use instead. And right now, 8% looks awfully good. I think actually the 8% is understated because the way people estimate betas is really bad. I think I can push it up to 20, maybe 22. But I'm going to be fine with that. You know why? Because there are 60 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still <laughs> alive, right? And to have this hubris of thinking you're going to build a model that explains 90, 95, 100%, it's not going to happen. You know, the reason I bring this up is a lot of managers who push back against my using the CAP app. They don't want to use an alternative model. You know what they want to use instead? Gut feeling. You know what the R squared of gut feeling is with returns? You think 8% is bad? You should see what happens when I let gut feeling drive investments. It's probably minus 8%. If you, I am not wedded to the cap and people somehow think, oh, I love, I don't like, I mean, to me, this is just a tool. You come up with a better tool, I'll switch in a minute, moment. In fact, when I teach my valuation class, I offer 12 alternatives to the cap app. And the reason I do that is I see people not doing valuation because they don't like the CAPM. And I say, why are you throwing the baby out with the bathwater? You don't like the CAPM. Here are 11 other ways you can do. Come up, because all I need is a risk adjusted rate. So if you don't like the CAPM, let it go. It's just a way of getting to an expected return. It might not be great, it might not be precise, but it gives us a starting point at least for thinking about hurdle rates. So the CAPM persists because of its opposition. The weakness of the other models comes from the fact that they're much more backward looking than the CAPM. And I'm going to make an argument that there is a way in which we can use the CAPM in a much more creative, much more forward looking way than it's being used in practice. So let's step back. The CAPM measures risk with a beta, right? Ultimately, we want a hurdle rate. So to get from a hurdle rate to a beta, I have to make the links. And before I do that, though, there is one final hurdle I have to get over. To use any of these models, I have to assume that the marginal investor is diversified, right? So who the heck is a marginal investor? I'll give you the two things you need, or the two criteria you have to meet to be a marginal investor. The first is you need to own a lot of shares in the company. So already, I don't want to insult any of you, so I'll tell you up front, I am not the marginal investor in any company I invest in. The reason I don't want to insult you is, who knows, you might be a billionaire. Right? So first, you need to own a lot of shares. The second is you need to trade those shares because the marginal investor actually affects prices. So you need to own a lot of shares and trade those shares. Ready? Let me try this on this. I move forward. Remember I showed you the, the 2003 and 2009 Steve Jobs showed up as a... In 2013, when I look on top, of course, you know, Steve, Steve had passed on. That's his... Who else has shown up on the list that wasn't there in 2009? How the heck did George Lucas end up here? Star Wars. Because when he sold Star Wars, Lucas Films, for four billion to Disney, came last talk with him. Which makes it kind of ironic that he had that critique after the Star Wars movie where he called Disney white slavers. Come on. You took four billion from these guys, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, in fact, I have a valuation of Star Wars on my blog that if you're interested, you can see. Do you think Disney got a good deal? Uh, yeah. yeah. My estimated value for the Star Wars franchise is about 10 billion. And it's not coming from the movies. The movies themselves are less than 2 billion in value. You know where the value of the Star Wars franchise comes from? That expanded Star Wars universe that George Lucas created has, I think, 7,229 characters. This was in the 1990s. He actually, as a merchandiser, this is your dream. Can you imagine 7,229 characters you can convert into toys? For every dollar that Disney makes at the box office on Star Wars, 
they make four dollars in other stuff. Merchandising, streaming. I mean, you can go down the list. Books. Yeah. It's an incredibly lucrative franchise, but there's... So let's think about it. Who's a modern investor in Disney? Is it Lorraine Jobs? She owns a lot of shares, but what does she not do? She's not doing. How do we know? Because if you look at her, her stock holding, you compare it to what it was in 2009, it's pretty much the same. So if you go down the list, it's not going to be Lorraine Jobs, it's going to be whoever. And if you look at the rest of the list, what do you see? A lot of institutional investors own a lot of shares. Remember, the, the assumption we're making is the margin investors diversified. Do you think I'm on pretty safe ground making that assumption at Disney? BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Capital, I mean these are all big institutional investors. Unless they're crazy, they are not just owning Disney, they're probably parts of portfolios. In the case of Disney, I feel completely comfortable assuming the modern investor is diversified. Doesn't mean that every investor is diversified. Is there some crazy guy in Omaha? Oh no, not in Omaha, <laughs> let me pick some others. No, we might pay, think I'm talking about the wrong guy. In Chicago with all his money in Disney, sure, there'll be some guy who thinks he can pick stocks. And, He's not the marginal investor though. The marginal investor is the one who sets prices and as long as that investor is diversified, you're going to be okay using the risk and return models in finance. You know when you're going to be in trouble? Is if I gave you a closely held small company, look at the top 17. And there are no institutions there. You have individuals, have three stocks, four stocks. Then we have to talk about what to do next because then none of these models are going to kick in. So we'll talk about how to adapt these models when you're not diversified. And I'm actually going to use Bookscape. How did I describe Bookscape? Private business with a single owner. Is an owner going to be diversified? How can an owner of a private business ever be diversified? Their entire wealth is tied up in the business. So we're going to have to come back to this later. But it's something that we'll talk about as we go through. Now looking at my other companies in my sample, I want to make the same judgment. Am I on safe ground assuming that the marginal investors diversify. So I took my five companies and I broke it down into institutional investing and individual investing. And you can already see that in these companies, in three of these companies, institutions own 70, 75%. That's actually the median number across US companies. Institutions own about 70% of the shares, <coughs> even in smaller companies. Individuals own a lot of Deutsche Bank, but the 41% of the institutions account for 90% of the trading in Deutsche Bank. The 41% that are institutional investors in Deutsche account for 90% of the trading. So if you look at the breakdown of trading each day, the individuals own a lot of shares in Deutsche, but most of them seem to have Deutsche in their portfolios, maybe <coughs> old time portfolios. You know you because you can actually see the breakdown of trading in the, on Bloomberg. If you go to the trading page, you can actually see the breakdown into institutions and individuals. So on, on most of the US and European companies, you can see the breakdown. Indian companies, I was able to get it for Tata Motors. I was actually getting the breakdown of who trades the shares. Right? Now, sometimes it might be because they, they might be masking the trading, the individuals, but for the most part, you can at least get a sense of where the institution where trades. Where does Bloomberg get that? Well, it looks at the exchanges, right? Because exchanges, when you have buys and sells, you can see who's buying and who's selling. That, again... The exchanges wouldn't give away who was the individual. Some of it is public information. New York Stock Exchange breaks down trading information. You can actually buy the trading data from the New York Stock Exchange. You might have to pay for it. Bloomberg might have to pay for it. But what does the, what does the exchange lose by sharing overall trading statistics? The exchange would know because it comes via a broker dealer. Yeah, so it could be that there's some masking in this process that means it. No. So it, it could be increasingly as trading goes off the floor, which is, which is happening, I think the statistic will get more and more fuzzy. Right. So, but the degree that I can get the statistic, the bulk of the trading in each of these five companies at least seems to be institutionally driven. Right. You have a question? You can't, you can't identify who those institutions you are. You can't, I, I don't have the no, names, no. but basically it's, 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 so they could, but what his point is that even that is a little fuzzy because an institution might be trading as a front for an individual, right? So there's, there's all these layers that you don't know about. The bottom line is with my five public companies, I feel okay assuming the marginal investor is diversified, more so with Disney than with Vale. <coughs> but I can let go of this. I'm, it's not going to be something I'm going to wrestle with at this stage saying, should I be adjusting the model? But if I had a small company in here which is closely held, 
I might have had to confront that issue right now. One of the, one of the things that I look for when I picked your companies is most of your companies are larger publicly traded companies. This assumption would be a pretty straightforward one for you to make, that institutions are the marginal investors. But it might be more difficult for some of your companies than others. Yes, sir. Just for my education, can you explain how a marginal investor can affect the price? Well, I think in the sense of that, that, that big transactions at the margin set the price. That's all I mean by affecting the price, which is you know, they're more likely to affect the price. Because if you trade 2 million shares, you have a bigger impact on the price than if you sell 2,000. So it's a, it's a question of marginal impact. So on a GE, you could trade 2 million shares and nobody might notice. But on a, on a company with less turnover, you're going to be able to affect the price. And my point is the more you can affect the price, the more I have to think about how do you think about risk because at the margin you're setting the price. So if I play that back to you, because I own loads of stock, right. um, I can do a run basically. If I suddenly sold half my stock, yeah. then there'd be panic in the market. There'd be, a, so there'd be a price impact. So that's basically it. There's a price impact. I can never have a price impact if I put a buy or a sell, but you could. Right? So that's a stop. And basically the only reason you're making that stop is to make sure that all of the models we're going to talk about are in fact viable or potential models you can use. So now let's get specific. I want to get from this model that I've talked about in the abstract to a hurdle rate, right? So I'm going to set up the equation that's going to animate how I think about getting to a hurdle rate. To get an expected return on an investment, I need three numbers. I need a risk-free rate. And we're going to start with that. I need an expected premium for investing stocks collected. I'm going to call it an equity risk premium. What are you going to earn on the risky portfolio as opposed to the risk-free rate? And I need a beta. So we're going to start this discussion by talking about the risk-free rate. What exactly is that risk-free rate? Then we're going to move our discussion to what kind of premium do investors collectively demand for investing in stocks? That's the equity risk premium. And then we're going to close the process by talking about how do I get a beta for a company. Because once I get those three numbers, I'm off and running, right? Because I can come up with an expected return and a hurdle rate. Yeah. Who of them is a hurdle rate? I'm sorry? Who of them is a hurdle rate? The, the expected return is a hurdle rate, the so final number. Say, so basically, I need these three numbers to get up to that. So the expected return is what I need to make, given your risk, that becomes my hurdle rate, given that investment. So let me start the process. I know we're very close to the break by at least laying out what I need for something to be risk-free. Remember that one-year table that I described as risk-free? Why was it risk-free? Because I knew exactly what I was going to make with certainty, right? Here are the two conditions you need to meet for something to be risk-free. The first is the entity issuing the investment can have no default risk, not even a tiny bit. Now already you can see how I made your life a lot more difficult, right? Because if you have a little default risk, it's not risk-free. The second is there can be no reinvestment risk. Let me explain. Let's say you want a risk-free rate for a five-year cash flow. And I give you a three-month T-bill rate. Is a three-month T-bill risk-free if you're looking at a five-year cash flow? Why? What happens? At the end of three months, you can reinvest. So basically, so a three-month T-bill is not risk-free if you're looking at a five-year cash flow. What would be risk-free if I were looking at a five-year cash flow? A five-year T-bond, but even a five-year T-bond is a little bit of a problem, right? It's got coupons every six months, which I want to strip out. So if I were a purist, if you ask me what a five-year risk-free rate is, I'd go look up a five-year zero coupon default-free bond. That's a pain in the neck because it means that your risk-free rate will actually be different for one year to year. We'll come back and talk about it, but that's a pure, if you're a purist, that's what risk-free rate is. And already, there are two implications that come out of what I just said. If you ask me what the risk-free rate is in U.S. dollars, I cannot answer the question unless you tell me over what time horizon. Right? It's kind of a nebulous question. Risk-free rate over what period? There is no one risk-free rate. And the second is, you cannot automatically assume that if I give you a government bond rate, that it's risk-free. Why not? It's not even currency. It's a fact that not interest rate. What did I say? You need no default risk. For too long in finance, we've acted as if government bond rates are risk-free. If you are afflicted with that disease, I have three words I'd like you to repeat ten times every night for the next ten days, and never again will use the word government bond and risk-free as interchangeable. You know what the three words are? Greek government bond. Greek government bond. Greek government bond. Or if you prefer, Argentine government bond, Venezuelan government bond. You can go down the list. I'm sorry? 
defaulted. You haven't defaulted yet, but it's only a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> so we can wait for the moment, but it'll happen. So one of the challenges we're going to have to face then is how do we come up with a risk-free rate in Argentine pesos? So after we come back from the break, we're going to talk about estimating risk-free rates. Starting easy first. We'll start with the currencies where at least we perceive no default risk. Swiss francs, risk-free rate, no brainer. And we're going to move up the ladder. Euro risk-free rate is going to be a little messier because it depends on which government you're looking at, right? And then we're going to go to Indian rupees, and then maybe if we're Nigerian Naira, we can keep going. But we're going to talk about the process of getting risk-free. So let's take a break and start back up in about 15 minutes.